those of you who were paying attention, we just had the bell ring, which means it's 10 o'clock. It is time to worship. And so just as we ring that bell to let people know that it's time to get into church for those who are in here, we start by reading from a word from the Lord so that we know it's time to worship. And I'd like to start today by reading from the 16th Psalm. There were some verses in there that I thought were quite good for us as we try to focus our minds around worship this morning. And so I'm going to read from Psalm 16, verses 5 through 11. And may the church be called to worship with these words. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is the word of the Lord for the morning. <clears throat> and let us pray to that God who, whose presence brings us joy. Father, thank you so much for a glorious spring morning. Thank you for a place where we can gather as your body, your people, your church to worship you. And Father, so as we gather here now, right now, may your Holy Spirit be moving inside of us, inclining all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our souls to worship you and you alone. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing in your sight this morning, and may we rejoice fully in your joy. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, we've started with a word from the Lord and a word to the Lord, and how about a joyful noise as well? Standing, standing, 
now you can sit. <laughs> well, welcome to a beautiful spring worship service here at the Fusky. Glad that you could all join us this morning. Uh, I do have a few announcements as we get started. First and foremost, if you weren't at the ministry building at 9.15 this morning, you missed out on a Bible study on the book of Revelations, but you can come next Sunday. And so we in invite you to come and be a part of that 9.15 from 9.15 to 9.45. Wednesday evenings, Anne is leading us through a Lenten study series focusing on the last week of Christ's life. It is a fantastic Wednesday evening. We have a meal together. We have a time of studying together. Um, and it's a pretty in-depth study. And so if you'd like to come and be a part of that this next Wednesday, just know that we'd love to have you join us at the ministry building. And Anne has left some of the, the question and reading sheets in the back so that you could come and be prepared. But if you find yourself looking at your watch and it's 5.30 on Wednesday evening and you realize that you haven't done the homework but you still want to go, well, come and show up anyway. We'd love to have you join us on that as well. We have a meeting of the bylaws committee following church today, so we'll be in the ministry building for that. For those of you that are participating in that, thank you for your ongoing participation. Hopefully, it'll be coming to a close in the next few sessions. Um, if you have a cell phone, <laughs> what an excellent reminder to go ahead and silence it. You know, you can, you, if you're feeling brave, you can turn it off. Most of us have these little buttons where you can just slide it to, to vibrate, and that way we won't hear it ring in the middle of the service. So. Sally, thank you for that. That was perfect. <laughs> um, if you are in need of restrooms, there are restrooms right here behind the building. They are available and they are clean due to our crack maintenance staff. So by all means, please feel free to avail yourself of those if you need to. Um, Holy Week is coming up. Palm Sunday is next Sunday. We'll have a Good Friday service at 3 o'clock here at the church and then Easter. Invite your neighbors. Let them know that this is a place where they are invited warmly to come and be a part of what we're doing. Um, it'll be a wonderful time of worship. So let's make the most of it and, and let's have this place just packed to the gills. Finally, uh, for those of you that aren't aware, our church is meant to be so much more than just what we do on a Sunday. And so we have opportunities for Lenten studies, we have opportunities for Bible studies, but we need to do a better job in terms of outreach efforts, in terms of youth ministry. We have a VBS coming up this summer, and all of those things depend upon volunteers, people feeling as though they've been led by the Lord to help out beyond just what we do here on a Sunday. And so if the Lord is speaking to you about maybe getting you a little bit more involved in other things, uh, please take that that provoking seriously, and maybe have a word with me after the service and see if we can figure out what might be a good fit for you. Are there any other announcements that we need to have from the floor for our community? I, well, I, I guess I should make sure that people know there's a fundraiser for the elementary school this afternoon down at Jolly Shores. Oysters and barbecue and, and fellowship. So if you don't know what you're doing this afternoon, that might be a good thing to do. Anything else? All right. In that case, most churches have a time of fellowship as part of their worship service where you get up and you greet one another in the name of the Lord. We are no different. Only I like to see us do it a little bit more enthusiastically. Instead of just getting up and greeting your neighbor, I know that not everybody here knows everybody else with whom you're worshiping. And so would you do me a favor as part of this worship time, as part of this fellowship time? Would you get up out of your seats and make an effort to go and get to know the name of somebody with whom you were worshiping? There might be a quiz. Just forewarning you, there could be a quiz on this. So get up out of your seats, spend the next couple of minutes greeting each other and getting to know one another.
our seats, please. That was some serious fellowshipping going on here. All right. So that was fellowshipping with a purpose. So did anybody remember the name of somebody they just met? Boy, I've never seen more people sitting on their hands. <laughs> Bill, you want to take one for the team? Yeah, I finally met here. Well, it's about time. <laughs> All right. Well, that was hard. So we'll just stop right there at one. Everybody remember to thank Bill later on. But Kathy, we were making a lot of noise there. With a mixed bowl. Where okay. we where are we going? We're going to number four oh four, the solid rock. Please stand when you have it. The solid rock. My home is built on nothing less. Ready? My hope is built. ahead and take your seats. We reached our time in our worship service where we have an opportunity for prayer requests and praise reports and testimonies and I do so love this time. Kathy, you want to start us off? Others? 
all the way in the back, Jennifer. All right, other prayer requests, praise reports, testimony, Sally. Yes, um, I would like to ask for prayers that I think um, may be dealing with um, a friend and a family member have moved to a new church in Florida right now. Mm-hmm. And just trying to pray with them. And as always, I'd like to pray for those who come, those who can't stay here, those who will not be able to have them. Lord, I just want to thank those that are here. Just pray now that her passage will be peaceful. Thank you. Yes. Well, and hopefully I'm not catching you by surprise to say also Lewis passed away. And then Chris is in, I uh, understand that maybe he got out of ICU yesterday, but is still in the hospital. This was a horrible week for the crew at Hay Point. Yes. Other prayer requests, praise reports, testimonies. This is your time. Yes, John. Hey, uh, close family friend. He's only in his 40s, but he was very critically ill, and we need to pray for him. And also, obviously, for the ongoing horrible tragedies in Ukraine and all the people suffering there. Uh, yes, Aaron. Uh, a praise report. I asked for prayer for my eight-year-old sister who visited me last week. She, she drove. Margaret, did I see your hand up? Yes, I have a 16 year old who just came in with lift off who has had a severe uh, pain in her shoulder and they've taken a bone marrow sample and also um, the rectal motor biopsy test. So we're waiting on the results to know that God can provide healing. <coughs> All right, others? Anyone else? Yes. Tiny?
Yvonne? Yeah, I'm thinking for you, Bob, uh, you and me and Craig, and then it's good to see all the beautiful faces around. And you guys, and thank you for coming out. And uh, I, I, I wanted to talk about um, the thing uh, that I have birthday coming up. Uh, seems like all my kids are going in the spring or summer. <laughs> And uh, she's 26. That's my oldest daughter. I can't believe I got a 26-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and my... Um, but she got a lot of 30 My, I guess my last daughter. I have three girls. And my last daughter, her, her oldest son was born today. Anyone else? All right. In that case, we'll do what we normally do, and that is we will pray. And I hope you all appreciate how important prayer is. Um, the life of a church, the strength of a church is really, you can figure what that is like by knowing how its people pray. And so we will pray now corporately. And I'm asking, as I always do, that when you hear one of these prayer requests that it resonates with you, that you take ownership of it, take it home with you, and make it a part of your prayer life through the balance of the week. <clears throat> it's one way that we continue to be in prayer together throughout the week. It's one way that you continue to lift up a brother or sister lovingly to the Lord while you are praying for your own concerns as well. But it all starts now. So let us, let us pray. Father. It is a gift, it is a blessing that you invite us to gather as your people, to lift up those things that are on our hearts and entrust you with them. And so, Father, in that spirit, we are here this morning. And Lord, we want to start with praise. Thank you for helping to demonstrate the strength of a community yesterday with the temporary loss of Carol Tejan and then getting people together to find her. We thank you for for her safe recovery, and we thank you for all who were willing to band together to go out and seek to save the lost. Father, we want to lift up to you Joseph, and we pray that on his birthday tomorrow, <clears throat> you would reflect on how uniquely you have created him, and we give you thanks that you have given him another year here. Lord, we want to lift up to you Sally's son, Tommy, and we know he's been through so many difficulties and now dealing with the loss of a, a friend and family member. Father, may he, may he turn to you for strength and comfort. May he realize that, that you've got a plan, that it is a good one. And may he find strength and comfort. May he find peace in that with you. We also want to give thanks to you, Father, for all who live here, for those who choose to come and be a part of our island for however long a time that might be. Lord, we pray that during their time here on the island, that they would find you, <clears throat> that they would see something about you that just draws them closer and closer to you. And Lord, we also want to lift up to you a world that is in turmoil as well. May your light shine brightly in the midst of darkness and may people find you. Lord, we want to lift up to you Carol's mom, May. And Father, she's had a good run, but now as she is in hospice, we pray simply, Lord, that you would bring peace to her and as John makes his way on up on Wednesday, we pray that your travel mercies would be upon him and, and be a comfort and a strength to Carol as well. Lord, this was a rough week for those who have spent so much time working on this island, being a part of, of who we are for Charles and his family, for Lewis and his family. Father, with the passing of these men, they leave a void, and we just ask that you would bring comfort and peace to their families. And as Chris is in the hospital, 
hopefully recovering, Lord. We pray that, that you would help him to get stronger, to get better, <clears throat> bring him back. Lord, Don has a close family friend who is very ill, and we just ask that, that you would be with him as well, help the doctors and the nurses to, to provide good and accurate treatment, successful treatment. We lift up to you all who are suffering in the midst of the, the war in Ukraine. <clears throat> Father, we know that people can find you even in the deepest, darkest moments. And may you, be, may you be found in this time. And may you help those who are seeking to bring humanitarian efforts. And Lord, would you simply just bring a quick stop to the violence. We want to give you praise for Anne's sister being able to make it here to having a good visit and then successfully making her way back. We thank you for that mercy. We want to lift up to you Margaret's niece, Melissa. And Father, any time a young person is waiting on the results of tests to find out what might be going on can be a scary moment. So we just ask that your comforting arms would be with them. And we pray, Lord, that <clears throat> those tests would reveal this is a perfectly healthy person. Father, for... Kathy's granddaughter, who <clears throat> was attacked by a dog, Lord, we're, we're grateful that she was not too badly harmed, but Lord, we're aware that, that scars and recovery are more than just what we see on the flesh. So while we pray that you would bring about quick and complete healing to her skin, Father, we also pray that you would be working in her heart and in her mind so that she would not be as fearful as she otherwise would be. We want to give you thanks for a successful community event this past Tuesday, and we pray, Lord, that for the FIA group that has been meeting so, so devoutly, so that you would just help them to keep going, help them to recognize how beneficial it is to come together to work towards common goals and, and sustain them, Lord, help them to keep moving. And Lord, we want to lift up to you praise for, for birthdays around Yvonne's family, for her oldest daughter's birthday last week and for her grandson's birthday today. What a blessing those days are, Lord, and we pray that there will be celebrations. Father, we know that there are other prayer requests in the hearts and minds of your people gathered here today, but we also know that you have promised that your Holy Spirit has already sought them out and that he will bring them to you and that you will do whatever is best and right for us. And so we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your love, and we praise you in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, we've gotten to the point for our scripture reading for today, and I've asked Anne to come on up and do our reading from Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter. Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 27. 16, 21 through 27. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. The word of the Lord. Okay, we have reached the time in our worship service for the offering, and John, can I call on you and Bill to come on up and pass around the plates? The offering is, most of what we do in our worship service is meant to 
try to be symbolic of what we should be doing with the rest of our week. Passing of the plate is always a wonderful way to make sure that we can meet the operating needs of this church, to keep the lights on, to keep reaching out to folks. But as we pass these plates around, it's meant to be a reminder that you have been blessed tremendously, not so that you can enjoy life better yourself, but so that you can in turn be a blessing to God's kingdom. And so as we are passing these plates around, I would invite you to contemplate the many blessings that God has poured out on you. Join me. time together. We thank you for the gifts you've given us and the gifts we are sharing. May this be to your kingdom and to the benefit of people in need. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <clears throat> thank you, John. Well, as we prepare for our message for today, I would just ask that you would bow your head in prayer with me to prepare our hearts and minds for this. Father, Lord, as we prepare for this message, I ask that you would empty me of myself, get me out of the way so that I'm simply an empty vessel through whom your word can flow. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be working in our minds so that we would receive these words and understand them as you have meant for them to be heard. And Lord, would you be working in our hearts as well? As always, Father, setting our hearts on fire with a love for your son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. As we prepare to discuss our reading for today, I want to see if we can get our, get our minds around where Peter's heart had to have been. Because Peter and the 12 disciples have been at this time walking with Jesus for nearly three years give or take. That's a lot of time to be spending with somebody. And when Jesus called them, they left. They left behind their jobs. They left behind their homes. They left behind their families, all so they could walk with Jesus, learn at the feet of their rabbi, be taught and grow. And they've been doing this for three years. And it is remarkable what they have experienced during that three-year time. They know that they have in Jesus a teacher who teaches not the way a traditional rabbi teaches. Rabbis had a history of building upon previous rabbinical teaching. But Jesus had a way of going straight to the word of God as if he were the author of it, as if he had personal knowledge about what it really meant not depending upon other people's interpretations of it. It was a profound teaching. And they saw in Jesus a man whose compassion was unparalleled. They saw how he tended to go to those who were the least of these and elevate them as if they were the most important people in the world. He would go to the Samaritans who were hated by the Jews and treat them with dignity. He elevated women, gave them a place in his ministry. And for the outcast, that seemed to be the place that he most wanted to be. The compassion that he had for people was not what you found amongst the leaders of the religious elite in Israel in that day. And then there were the miracles. Time and again, they witnessed the miracles. 
They knew that Jesus was the man who, with just a mere word, could calm the winds and the seas. He could take one boy's lunch and feed thousands with it. And he healed too many people to count. And when you think about these healings, it ranged from people who were just sick and running fevers to people who were blind, deaf, mute, lame. There was one woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years, and merely by touching Jesus' garment, she was healed. He would touch the untouchable, those with leprosy, the ceremonial unclean, and he would make them clean. He even raised them from the dead. Now, when you walk with a man for three years and you see all of this, you start forming in your minds opinions about who he might really be. And you start thinking, if he is who I think he is, and we've been here by his side, when others have fallen away, we're in pretty good shape. And so when Jesus finally says to them, who do you say I am? Peter responds, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus instead of trying to humbly back his way out of that, does the opposite. He says to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Can you imagine what Peter must have been feeling at that moment? To know that all of those years spent following Jesus, and now he has proof that not only is he following the Son of God, but that Son of God has promised that he, Peter, is going to hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven. There was a time when Peter was invited to go out and walk on water, and he fell. I have no doubt that at this moment, Peter could have walked across the ocean. He must have just been riding high, knowing that he was right next to the Son of God. What would not happen for him? If he holds the, kings, the keys to the kingdom of heaven, surely as he walked the streets of Jerusalem, people would look at him and revere him. People would say, that's somebody. We need to make sure that we treat him well. Surely Peter knew that all the hard work was going to pay off with this position of power and authority. Sacrifice well made. Peter must have been feeling so good about himself. And so that's where his mind is as we get into our verses for today. And so if we consider how Jesus starts out, verse 21, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples. Well, so from that time on, we can make one of two assumptions. That either Jesus had determined that based upon this revelation, his apostles had gotten far enough in their understanding of who Jesus was to be able to handle what he is about to teach them. Or he's realizing that the days are few. His time as an, on earth as a his earthly ministry is about to draw to a conclusion. And so he's just got to get on with what is about to happen. And so from that time on, he tells him that he would need to go to Jerusalem. No big surprise there. The Jewish men were called to come to Jerusalem for various festivals throughout the year. The Passover was coming. And so for Jesus to have to go to Jerusalem was no big surprise. They understood that. But he said he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. That's not pleasant, but that also was not a surprise. John chapter 7 captures how Jesus showed up halfway through the Feast of the Tabernacles. And while he was up there, it talks about how 
people were saying, isn't he the guy that these leaders want to have killed? There were even people who tried to seize him while he was up there at that time. And so for Jesus to go to Jerusalem and be threatened was not a surprise. It was understood. He was not liked. He was a threat to the power structure. So that's not a big deal. That's not a surprise. That shouldn't have shocked them at all. But then he says something that gets their attention beyond all things. He says he's going to suffer at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. I can promise you this. That portion that comes at the end of that statement and be raised to life, they probably didn't hear because he says, I'm going to be killed. And when you're hanging your hat on this one man and he tells you he's going to die, it doesn't really matter what he says after that. Because in that moment, what Peter hears is all of my hopes and all of my dreams are gone. You told me that I was going to have the keys to the kingdom. But if they kill you, I'm going to be at the mercy of the guy that holds the keys to the dungeon. Life is not going to go well for any of this. So how can you possibly be who I proclaimed you to be, who you affirmed to me, and then tell me you're going to go up there and die? That doesn't work. And so Peter, <coughs> bless his heart. That's right, you all know. You say bless his heart, you can say pretty much anything after that and it's going to be okay. <clears throat> Peter takes aside the one who he had just proclaimed as the son of the living God and says, you got this all wrong. This cannot be. You will not die. <laughs> never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Poor Peter. Peter hears from Jesus that something bad is going to happen that he can't understand, and the only thing he can comp comprehend is that it's not going to go well for him. And he thinks that's reason enough to pull aside the Son of God and say, uh-uh, not your will, but my will is going to be done. If only all of us weren't guilty of having done the same thing. But poor old Peter called on the carpet. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Peter, who has just been praised by God, by God's son, Jesus Christ, now receives the most stinging rebuke that we can imagine. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I can't imagine a more stinging rebuke from Christ our Savior than to be told that I have become a stumbling block to his church, to be called Satan. Now, to be fair, we don't know if Jesus at that moment is speaking to Satan who is working through Peter or if he's speaking to Peter who has allowed himself to be influenced by Satan. But either way, I promise you this, he is looking straight at Peter when he is saying this. And that has to be so thoroughly uncomfortable and so convicting as well. He would then go on to say this, Jesus, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is, coming, is going to come in his Father's glory with the angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Now, Jesus isn't just saying this to Peter. He rebuked Peter directly. But now he's talking to all 12 of his apostles. And essentially what he's saying to them is, you know all that you've given? You still haven't given enough. I 
can't imagine what that would be like. They thought that they have left everything behind. They have stayed by Jesus' side as there have been tens of thousands. And when they have fled away, dwindling down to just those 12, and they have sacrificed. And to be told by Jesus at this point that you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. They've got to be thinking, what more could we give to you? Deny themselves? Surely they had done that already. Take up their cross? Oh, wait a second. <laughs> now we're going someplace different. They knew what a cross was. You don't live in Roman-occupied territory where they have this torturous execution device that slowly drains the life out of people. You know what that is. You know it's about the cruelest thing ever invented. And they knew it. Deny yourself okay. But take up a cross and follow me. They knew Jesus was saying he was going to die. They didn't know that he was going to die on the cross. I promise you they were hoping that wasn't going to be the case. And then he says, follow me. Even if it means going to that cross. Any of you are familiar with the uh, Air Force acrobatic crew, the Thunderbirds? It's, if you've ever seen them fly, it is amazing that people can fly these jets with such precision and with such proximity. It's, it's almost as if, if you could withstand the, the wind, you could go and walk from wing to wing of these planes, so tightly do they fly. Well, back in 1982, there were four of them out on a training flight, honing their skills because you can't let those skills go stagnant. And they performed a loop. Now, the thing about flying with the Thunderbirds is you have a lead flight, a lead plane, and everybody else is so focused on him because they have to stay tight. They can't be looking anywhere else. They have to follow their leader. And so they were doing a great big loop. And it's not terribly spectacular if you pull out of your loop and you're still 5,000 feet above the ground. For their plan to work, they were going to pull out of their loop 100 feet above the ground and just go screaming along the ground. Well, had the lead flight. Everybody else stand right on his wings, and something went wrong. And at the bottom of the loop, instead of pulling out, that plane plowed straight into the ground. The other three planes were following their leader so tightly, it was as if they all hit the ground at the same time. They followed their leader, even to death. And that's what we're called to do. The world, of course, says, that's really stupid because life is precious. And why on earth would you follow someone so closely that it might cause you to lose your life? The world says, that's a foolish thing to do. Step back a little bit. Assess some of these demands because, frankly, they seem outrageous. Now, in a world that says if you work hard and you have a little luck, you can have phenomenal success, Jesus says, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Unfortunately, we all kind of feel like we're Peter, like we've been promised the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is saying, life owes you nothing. Follow me. Or perhaps more clearly to us, Jesus says, if you're not following me, you are a satanic stumbling block. Jesus says, if you want to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for his sake, we will find it. And he would know. He is the author of all life. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the one who promises that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father except through him. Follow him.
even on the way to the cross. We want to think that we're good followers of Christ, of course. We come to church, we're here, it's a Sunday morning, and here we are. We all have our Bibles, and, and frankly, some of us even read them. We say prayers sometimes. We try to look like a Christian and walk like a Christian and talk like a Christian. But unfortunately, that doesn't sound an awful lot like somebody who is denying themselves and following Christ. In fact, it kind of sounds like somebody who's lukewarm. And if you're familiar with where that word lukewarm shows up in Scripture, that ought to make you very uncomfortable. <laughs> For when John was recording the revelation given to him while he was on Patmos, Jesus said to him, I want you to take a letter into the church, the people in Laodicea. I want you to write this. Oh, if you were hot or cold, but you were lukewarm and I will spit you out. That doesn't sound like a lot of praise to me. That, in that instead sounds like a condemnation. Perhaps it would be clearer if I put it this way. According to what Jesus just said, there are no lukewarm Christians. Either you're all in or you're not in at all. That's what Jesus says. That's what Jesus teaches. And in the midst of one of the sharpest rebukes that we find in Scripture, Jesus proclaims it to Peter. If you're not following my will, you're not doing enough. Doesn't matter what your goals and ambitions in life are. If it's not my will, it's the wrong will. And it's the wrong way. It doesn't matter what your health is, doesn't matter what your wealth is, doesn't matter if you have power or prestige. If those are things that you have pursued instead of following Christ, it's all going to perish anyway. There's only one way, and his name is Jesus Christ. For those who would say that it's not worth giving those things up, after all, we earned them, we deserved them. And life is so comfortable. Jesus says simply, get behind me, Satan. You've become a stumbling block. Remember this, my friends. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And when he tells us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow him, then all I can say is we need to do that right now. If he felt that he needed to rebuke Peter, the one to whom he was going to entrust the keys to the kingdom of heaven with, we should consider ourselves worthy of no less a rebuke. He proved he was worth following when they finally realized that Peter had maybe ignored those few words that Jesus said after he would be killed. Because three days later, he would raise from the dead. That tomb was empty. And he declared for all the world to see, if you want to believe somebody, believe the guy that walked out of the tomb. His words are trustworthy and true. And his words are clearly indicating the way. And so I would simply say to all of us this day, please deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Christ. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for the clear teaching of your word. It is not an easy teaching, Lord. It is hard in this world, and it will be ridiculed. But, Father, we know that if we seek you earnestly, that you will give us the strength to overcome a world 
your Holy Spirit will comfort us and be with us always, helping us to get through those difficult times, even if those times lead us to the cross for ourselves. But Father, if we submit ourselves to you, we know that we shall be raised up with you. And so help us to live our lives this day and forevermore in a manner that brings you glory, brings you honor, and brings you praise. Because, Father, it's not for our will to be done, but for yours. So we thank you for your love, Father. And we praise you in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And our closing hymn. Friends, if you heard something in that message or in this closing hymn, Jesus tugging on your heart in a way that you have never surrendered to before, I want to invite you to come forth. You don't have to come this very second. You can come and you can wait until everybody else leaves. But please, if you're feeling that on your heart, don't let yourself leave this church without coming forward and talking more about the love of Christ. But for our closing benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit rest, abide, and remain in each and every one of you. And in so doing, may he grant you that amazing capacity to go forth from here to truly love your neighbor as yourself. And the church all said, Amen. You've entered to worship, depart to serve, and may you all have a truly blessed week. <laughs>